Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. I'm Andrew Sumner, uh, and I'm here with an old friend of Forbidden Planet, Garth Ennis. How are you, mate? Pretty good, Andrew. How are you doing? Uh, all right. One of the things we're linking to right here is the complete edition of Out of the Blue, uh, published by Aftershock, which you can buy from the links attached to this conversation by yourself and the great Keith Burns. What mm. can you tell me about the genesis of that? Because that's a, such a beautiful uh, comic book series. Mm. It um, it had a sort of a long drawn out genesis, really. It First of all, it's a sequel to an old Vertigo War story called Archangel, which is now published by Avatar. Uh, and that's in the second War Story collection. Um, and that was the story of a hapless uh, permanent loser fighter pilot called uh, Jamie McKenzie, who gets himself volunteered, i.e. assigned whether he likes it or not to flying um, hurricane fighters off uh, catapult ships where the aircraft is simply shot off. Um, the pilot then fights the, the enemy aircraft attacking whatever convoy the ship's assigned to. And he's then left with the option of uh, bailing out into the Arctic Ocean or, or perhaps ditching, or if he's lucky, uh, if he's close enough to land, making it to a Russian air base, because these, these ships were, were uh, quite often assigned to the supply convoy sent to Russia. Uh, Jimmy, um, Jimmy does better than he expects, but his long suffering hangdog personality seemed to, uh, seemed to suggest there was more life in the notion. And so um, I did pitch a sequel to Vertigo. Karen Berger specifically. And then Karen was let go by Vertigo. Um, of course, this is already 10 years ago, I think. Yeah, right on, it's a long time. And then Avatar took over the war story. So the obvious thing seemed to be to, um, uh, to do the sequel for them. Um, and then Avatar began to suffer problems of their own, which I think they're still undergoing. And fortunately, I was able to get the book in at Aftershock, courtesy of, of uh, Joe Pruitt, another of my weekend drinking partners. Um, and with Keith Burns assigned on the art, we were off to the races. Um, so it's, it was a good long stretch. It must have been about 10 or 12 years between the genesis of the idea and um, and actual publication. And you, and you just mentioned one of the things that's very memorable about all iterations of that series, which is the characterization of Jamie McKenzie himself. Mm. Yeah. So where did that come from? Um, I like those sort of long suffering hangdog losers. I mean, I've always found you can you can get a lot of material out of guys like that. And I like the idea of someone who had almost a kind of a split personality quality to him where on the ground, um, among his friends, with the officers who command him, with his girlfriend, eventually wife at home, he really doesn't have much get up and go. He re There's something kind of likable about him. He's an essentially decent guy, but he has no oomph. And you want a chap with an oomph. And yeah. Jamie's oomph doesn't appear until he gets behind the controls of a fighter plane. Yeah. And then the enemy had better watch out. So this is where the other half of his personality kicks in. He loves it. He lives for it. He's just not really aware of it. Because as soon as he steps out of the cockpit, of course, all his doubts and frustrations and anxieties take over again. And he's poor bloody Jamie. And I wanted to kind of take him a bit further down that road and then eventually see if I could get him off it. See if I could, uh, if I could give Jamie some kind of a happy ending. Yeah. Which, of course, you managed to do with your old, um, your old partner Keith Burns, who, mm -hmm. uh, who, of course, you you uh, you produced another great war series with Keith, which is actually for you know with my other hat on my Titan Comics hat on, of course, you know yeah. for Titan Comics, you know That's for right. uh, you know for um, Johnny Johnny. Red, edited yeah. by the great Steve White, our mutual friend. Indeed, you know, indeed. Yeah, that was a that was a marriage made in heaven. That one that worked out yeah. great. It wasn't the first work Keith and I had done together because uh, he'd worked on war stories. He'd uh, he'd worked on the boys, but it was really the first time we were able to put our own stamp on something from the get go. 
Um, so it seemed like a natural choice to just go straight from that to out of the blue. Um, yeah. And we kept Jason Wordy on the colors as well. He really makes uh, Keith's stuff look, uh, look great. Um, yeah, Keith is, um, in a way, I've said this before, but in a way he's the, the artist I've been waiting for all these years because he feels the same way about war stories as I do. And he thinks about them the same way I do and the stuff it's second nature to him. Drawing that stuff makes a kind of sense to him that um, other artists perhaps never really achieve, or if they do, it's through um, a good deal of effort and the application of a good deal of reference. Whereas in Keith's case, it's just second nature. It just comes to him straight away. I don't have to send him reference. Um, I don't have to correct anything he does because he, just like me, he's already got it all in his head. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you can definitely feel that when you read it because it's got the books, all the books you've just referenced have that kind of propulsive sort of gritty quality to them, you know, and you really feel like in the same way that there's something you and I've talked about a lot, you know, back at Picture Library, it's like, it's that same experience when, you know, yeah. when you used to read that back in the day, you read what he does. And of course you have another amazing person involved with this project as well, with a massive kind of war book pedigree is Ian Kennedy. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That was, um, that was a real stroke of luck um, for the collected edition. Um, we were able to use six covers that uh, Ian had done um, for a private collector um, because the, the, the book, given that it, because of its long and twisted Genesis story was originally going to be six issues. So there would have been six covers. Um, and there's an art collector, a chap called Stuart. I don't want to get his surname wrong, but it's in the introduction to the book. Uh, and thanks to Stuart, who decided to commission, privately commission six covers uh, from Ian, and with the kind permission of both, we were able to include these as chapter breaks in the collected edition of Out of the Bulu. And uh, it's such a joy to have Ian's artwork in there. I mean, he he's like Keith, um, and long before Keith started, of course, Ian's just a natural. He really is. He talks about when he draws aircraft, it's as if he's up there with them. And you can see that the way, the way his mind works, he's clearly thinking about all the different angles he could draw them from, the different uh, choreography he could bring uh, to the layout of a cover. Um, it It's just tremendous having him in the book. It really is. Yeah, for for me as a reader, it was it was a real joy because uh, to, to access you back to memory lane for a second, you and I first worked together when I was at IPC Time Warner and we were working on Battle of Britain, which right. I put together with the DC Wildstorm guys. Right. You wrote, of course, Colin Wilson for the art. And I don't know if you remember, but we massively tried to get Ian to do the covers for that book. And at right. that time, he just wasn't in a place where he could do mm -hmm. it. And uh, we thought we had him and then, then we, he wanted to do it, but he couldn't do it. And I remember being gutted about that at the time. So seeing this beautiful collection of Out of the Blue with his involvement just felt like a sweet kind of 20 years later outcome to me. Yeah, you're, you're quite right. I mean, that said, Gary Leach did tremendous covers for that. They were amazing. They were amazing. They were gorgeous. Um, but yes, it, it's, it's been nice to sort of get Ian in, into a book you know, at long last into a book with my name on it. I mean, that means a hell of a lot to me. I remember those war picture libraries and those Battler Britons and those commandos. And he did a lot of work for battle as well. He would show up all over the place. Uh, so yeah, that meant a hell of a lot. Yeah, I, I totally understand that. And you're right, by the way, I wasn't trying to talk down Gary. He just did those amazing, the covers we got for Battle of Britain were amazing. Yeah. Something that, um, something you mentioned in passing uh, where your, your 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 colleagues at Avatar, mm -hmm. who uh, we, again we were talking, they've got they've gone somewhat quiet of late, but in fact they are just releasing some special editions of your Rover Red Charlie series, right. of each of the comics in that series, which again are van the, the, the special dog themed covers, mm -hmm. which are Dog Day editions, which are again available for order from the links attached to this conversation. Looking mm -hmm. back on that, what can you what can you tell me about that series, mate? Just to round yeah. out with. Um, that one actually started life. There's um, 
there's a painting of three dogs, just headshots on three dogs that used to hang on the wall of my grandparents' farm in Donegal. It now hangs on the wall of my office. And it's three dogs sort of looking in all directions at once, like dogs try to do. And they always looked to me when I would look at that, that picture as if they, they wanted to go on an adventure. And I think that's what Rover Red Charlie was. It was me taking those <laughs> two dogs and sending them on an adventure. Um, beyond that, I think I was in sort of vaguely apocalyptic mood at the time, uh, having written Crossed, obviously. And I thought about an end of the world story for dogs um, where they would first of all have to somehow get a grip on the uh, on the notion of being on their own now, no no humans or feeders as they called them, to look after them, and they would also ultimately have to go on some kind of journey because dogs don't really know what to do on their own. They do, but they're always wondering, I suppose, what they should be doing, and so they go looking for someone to tell them what to do, and. Um, you might say in, in the process, find out for themselves. Um, and that was a pleasure to do. Um, uh, terrific artwork by uh, Michael DePascale, uh, who actually, I just did a one pager Rover Red Charlie story with for this, uh, this environmental comic, this um, most important comic strip ever. Yeah, um, and he's as good as ever. And it was, it was nice to revisit those three, actually. But uh, yeah, if you like animal stories, that might be the one for you. I mean, there's, um, there's the sort of thoughtful little leader type, um, there's the half wit, and then there's the sort of good natured big mouth. And as a trio, I think they make a pretty good team. So that's Rover Red Charlie. Brilliant. Well, that's you at your canine best, mate. And, and on, on that note, once again, the two books that we've talked about, you can order from the links attached to this. Thanks for joining me, brother. I'll see you soon. Cheers, mate. See ya. Cheers, mate. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.